It's time to continue our series. We're going through the top thousand of board game geek, and from each section of 100, we're only choosing 10 games. This is 800 to 900. No, wrong. 900 to 801. Well, you'd get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like a close enough guy. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you're titling your Mikey videos. Mikey is leading the good enough crew. It's horseshoes and handy grenades for me, <laughs> man. Good enough close crew enough. coming through. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Nick. I'm Mike. We are going through our uh, the top 1,000 games on board. Geek. 100 at a time. We're picking our top 10 games from each 100. Last time we did 1,000 to 901. This one is going to be 900 to 801, as Mike said in the opener. Exactly. Now, we only get 10 games to choose, and I'll tell you, this is already very difficult because there's more than 10 games we want to talk there's about. There's some bangers already. I know, but we're going to talk about the top 10 games right now. Alrighty, our number 10 in 900 to 801, our 10th favorite game here is The Mind. I know The Mind is very divisive. Some people love it, some people really, really hate it. I like The Mind. It's simple, it's fun, it's just doing exactly what it's trying to do. The Mind is a little card game where you have 100 cards, the cards are labeled 1 through 100, and you are trying to, everyone is given a certain amount of cards depending on what round you're in, and you are trying to put the cards down in numerical order, in ascending order, so 1, 2, 3, 4, like that. In the very first round, everyone has one card. And the problem is, you're not allowed to talk, as I'm sure, there must be some kind of catch, right? You can't talk. And so you're kind of just going off of vibes and going off of like, huh, we only have one card, mine is 20. No one's moved yet. Do I think 20 is the lowest card? I mean, there's only four cards around the table. Should I start? You start kind of moving a little bit and seeing what everyone else is doing. And then you kind of place it down and no one freaks out, you're like, Okay, cool. And then, and so you were just trying to put them down in order. First round, pretty darn easy to do so. After the first round, you shuffle up the cards. Now everyone gets two cards. And again, you have to go in um, numerical order. And then the next round, everyone gets three cards and four cards and five cards. I think all the way up to 12 or so. It gets really, really ridiculous. I've never won this game completely. It's very difficult. But it's just fun. You just get into this kind of giggly mood. Where you're kind of like, oh, uh, uh, and both two people are kind of, Oh God, oh God, oh, who is it, who is it, who is it? It's just silly fun, I don't know. Some people really hate this game. I think it's just, it's tr it's not trying to be anything it's not. It's just that, it's just silent, trying to put down those cards and numbers, just going completely off of vibes, and that's it, it's really fun. One thing that we like to do with this game is we like to talk as much as humanly possible, and what I mean by that is we'll play the mind where we're constantly talking, but we're talking in really, really vague terms. <laughs> so. So we'll be like, okay, this one we're in a grocery store. Okay, so I'm by the eggs. Where are you? You by the milk? Okay, I'm by the eggs. And then some people are like, I'm at the cash register. I'm at the cash register right now. And like, you would think that makes it easier and it probably does, but we do it in such a weird chaotic way that it actually a lot of times makes it harder. And some people are like, I'm in my car heading home, which means you have like 98 or something like that. It's just a fun, silly way to go about it. I don't know, I like the mind. I think it's a good game. It's uh, it, it, yeah, it's fun. I don't care what you say. <laughs> so number nine is Raccoon Tycoon. This is a game all about stock markets and auctioning and building and stuff, but set in a wonderful animal world where everyone's very fancy and rich and it's great. <laughs> Raccoon Tycoon's awesome because it's ultimately quite light. I did not know that when I first went to play this game and someone explained it to me in like literally four minutes. And I was like, oh, that's the, okay, that's great. I can get with that. In this game, you're kind of playing with the stock market to, to uh, hopefully you want to have the most money. That's obviously the goal. Uh, what you're doing on a turn is you're oftentimes slipping over a car that's going to give you some production. You'll get a couple resources, might be like stone, or iron or goods and things like that, wine, stuff that you're kind of uh, hoping to sell. And on the bottom of that card, it's gonna give you certain types of resources that are gonna become more valuable. The stock market is kind of going up on those types of goods. Uh, and so what you're hoping to do is accumulate a bunch of certain types of resources, wait for that market to get real high on wheat, then sell all that wheat for the maximum amount of dollar. And then <laughs> for every unit you sold in that sale, you're gonna drop the market down because you now flooded it with product. It's all supply and demand here. You can basically also turn in resources uh, and spend your money to uh, buy buildings. They're gonna give you all sorts of ways to mitigate the game, break the rules of the game. 
There's different town cards you can buy, and then you can have auctions for different railroads, kind of fat cat railroad and different, you know, fancy dog railroads. And uh, there's a bit of set collection there. If you want, if you get the dogs, you wanna get as many of the dogs as you can when they come out or the raccoons or whoever it might be. So it's all about kind of generating resources, turning those resources into money. How do you make your money make you more money? Because at the end of the day, all those buildings that you have, all the railroads you have, the town cars, the money you have are all gonna be kind of your accumulated wealth. Uh, and it's just a really fun world. And the fact that it's so light and easy to get into makes it really great. There's a high level of kind of appeal with this one with the animals and stuff. So that is Raccoon Tycoon. Number eight is a line game, and this is Parade. Parade is, uh, is the one I played at least, is an Alice in Wonderland theme. This is one that most people have, the big Cheshire Cat in the front. Um, Parade is a really great kind of line manipulation, line management game where you are trying to not take cards in this game. So when you place a card at the end of the parade, you might have to take cards, which is generally actually always a bad thing. Basically, whatever card value you put in there, you will count that many cards forward and all those cards are safe. You will not have to take them. So if you put down a five, I'll count five cards up and then all those cards I will not have to take. But anything else in the parade that's the same color as the card I placed down or the same value or less, I will have to take into my hand. So playing something like a 10 is kind of safe because that means 10 cards you won't have to take. But then basically anything after that you are going to have to take because everything is either gonna be 10 or less. And then anything you have in your hand at the end of the game is gonna be negative points. If you end up taking a nine, that's nine points. You don't want nine points. You want zero points basically. But you can also like shoot the moon in the game where if you have like the most of one color, you get to flip all your cards face down. They're all still worth points, but they're all only worth one. So there's kind of a weird point where you're like, oh gosh, should I just shoot the moon with red? Should I just try and get the most red and really mess things up? It's really, really fun. It's just a simple little game just kind of line management, line, not really manipulation, because you're not changing the line, but just putting down stuff and just trying to desperately, desperately not take cards. It's really, really fun. It's a classic. It's been out for, God, like 15 years now. It's really, really fun. Small game you can put in your pocket, carry it with you everywhere you go. It's really great. Parade's awesome. Number seven is Kitchen Rush. This is a real-time game all about running a restaurant. And you have orders coming in with different recipes that you gotta make. And there's a lot to consider in this cooperative real-time game because if an order comes in, needs a bunch of meat, and you go to the fridge, there's no meat there. You gotta go shopping and get some meat, and you gotta do it quick. So this game is all about how you use your workers, which are sand timers. And when you put a sand timer down to cook some food or go grab some spices or whatever it might be, you have to keep your sand timer there until the sand runs through and then you can pick it up, flip it over and put it onto a new action space. You only have four real time minutes to do your round. So it's all about the communication, the coordination between everybody. If someone's going shopping for supplies, be like, please get me cheese, I really need cheese. And I always like, the, I always like to think that's how like a, a real restaurant is where you're kind of hollering out for this. Oh, I gotta make that sauce. You gotta do this over here. And the, the kind of way that any kitchen at a restaurant gets food out is amazing to me. Uh, and so I love that Kitchen Rush kind of indulges in that, puts the pressure on, cranks up the, the, the stove fire uh, by putting it on real time. I think it's so fun and really a challenge to get all the resources you need. Everything of course costs money and you're trying to make money as a restaurant, make sure you can pay your staff. It can be brutal, that is Kitchen Rush. Number six is a game I feel like we've ended up talking about quite a bit over here on BGG, and that is Palm Island. Palm Island is a game that you play in the palm of your hand. That's why it's called Palm Island. It is a deck of cards, and this game, you can actually play a whole bunch of different ways. You can play solo, cooperative, or competitive, which is pretty surprising considering it's just a deck of cards. But it's a deck of cards you play in your hand, and on the top of these cards will be some kind of resources like stone, fish, wood, and um, also on top of the cards, on the cards themselves are gonna be different buildings, different stuff you can like make and upgrade the cards to get points. So when you have a card at the front of your hand here, you can choose to turn it to the side and that'll be worth the resources. And you turn to the side and put it to the back of the deck and then it'll kind of, things will start cycling through. If you get to a point where you want to essentially upgrade something, you can pay resources. And the resources are the ones that are to the side there. So if I have like two stone, three wood, and this thing takes, 
you know, two stone, three wood, I can turn those back upright, which means I've used those resources. And then I can then buy that part of the card. And that card might make the card flip over. It might make it turn upside down. And so there's all these different ways the cards will kind of manipulate to essentially get the most points by the end of it. You'll go through the deck a number of times, I think four times throughout the game, or maybe, no, I think it's eight times throughout the game. And then once you go through it eight times, at that point, you go through and you count all the points you've accumulated over the game, and that's how you win. It's a really fun game. If you like going to like amusement parks like Disneyland or Six Flags or something like that, it's a really great game because again, it's in the palm of your hand, it can fit in your pocket. But if you're sitting in line, just like hanging out for like an hour waiting for, you know, Face Mountain or something like that, you're gonna sit there and play Palm Island. It's really great. We've played it on rides, which was not advised. You shouldn't do that. We've done it before. <laughs> it was not a good idea. We did, it was fun. Um, but nonetheless, Palm Island's a really great game. Palm Island, you fit in your hand. You can also get like a plastic version of the game, which means you can play it in water. I've played this in a hot tub. It was great. I love Palm Island. Number five is Seven Wonders Architects. This is a game that we quite enjoy. Uh, we enjoy this more than Seven Wonders. I know we're in the minority there, but for us, Seven Wonders was never quite our favorite game. And so having something that's a little bit easier to kind of get into like a Seven Wonders Architects, gets rid of having to pass hands of cards around is really great for us. So it gives all the theming of building a wonder of the world. And now you're hoping to collect either, depending on which section of the wonder you're building, uh, three or so of different resources. It can be wood, brick, and stone, or whatever it might be, or you need three of the same resource. If I can get three papyrus, that'd be great, so I can build up this next section. And you're kind of each a different uh, empire building up your wonder. The wonder itself might give you uh, special abilities, like you can beef up your military or your science and things like that. There's cards that will also beef up those two things and get you different science tokens, much like Seven Wonders. In Seven Wonders Architects, you might have military uh, battles where you'll just compare your strength with the neighbors to your left and right. And based off of that, you will uh, get some like little military victory tokens. So it kind of takes a lot of the stuff from Seven Wonders, which is already a fairly quick game, and strips it down, simplifies it even further to kind of make it really family weight, which is something we enjoy because you can bust it out kind of with anybody, but Seven Wonders Architects. Number four is a game that I feel like we evangelize quite a bit for, and that is Blue Lagoon. Blue Lagoon is a Reiner Knizia game where you are um, kind of Polynesian people um, coming across these uh, beautiful like archipelago, like uninhabited islands with a whole bunch of resources on them. And the first, the game takes place over two halves, and the two halves are very similar, but at the same time kind of different. So basically the first half of the game, you're gonna be coming in through the water and on your turn, you're gonna place one of your chips down. Your chips have either a boat on them or just someone walking on them. And the boat ones go on water, the walking ones go onto land. And you can kind of put your boat ones out anywhere because you're essentially coming into these islands from really any different direction. And you are trying to then get onto these islands and putting essentially lines of your people Whenever you put your person onto a resource, you get to take that resource. You want set collection to be worth points at the end of the round. And then you're essentially trying to have unconnected, unbroken lines of your people going to different islands. You want to have area control on the different islands. You want more of your people than anyone else. You want to be touching as many islands as possible. Whole bunch of different ways you can score. The round will end once everyone's put out all of their chips and then you will score. Again, you get set collection, a little bit of area control, um, kind of touching all the different islands gets you points. You get all your points. And then one thing you do in the first half of the game is you also set out these little huts. And those little huts will stay there. And then after you've scored for the first round, all of your pieces with the exception of your huts will come off of the board. And now you will play again. All the resources will go back out on the board randomly. And then now same thing. Now you'll put out a piece on your turn, either as a, a person in a boat or a person walking and that's it. But the difference is now, now you're coming out of your huts. You have now inhabited these islands and now you're spreading out from there. So where you place your huts really matters. You wanna put them all in one clump because then they're all gonna be around each other. You wanna space them out. And then now the exact same scoring things happen. You're getting set collection, you're trying to touch all the islands, have the unbroken chains of your people and you are then having to go out of your huts. And that's the only difference, but that little difference does make a pretty big difference. Um, and it's really, really fun, super simple game. Um, it's Ryder Knizia, the king of themes, so it's got tons of theme. It doesn't, it has no theme at all. But nonetheless, Blue Orange made really, really pretty art. It's really good looking. And it's just a simple, clean game. I really, really like Blue Lagoon. It's absolutely outstanding.
Number three, Circadian's First Light. We actually just replayed this. They have a new expansion that's coming soon. We got to try it out. This is a game where you are landing on an alien planet, uh, you humans, and you are kind of learning about this new planet in kind of pursuit of knowledge. And, and ultimately what I really love is seeking a, a peaceful mission. So you're gonna run into different alien factions that live here and you're gonna open up negotiations with them and try to work with them. You're trying to gather resource uh, samples like algae and stuff from the planet itself to build out these kind of prototypes, these kind of contracts and stuff to send things back to your home planet. Uh, I really like the fact that you're kind of going around and um, doing stuff on the planet, but with the idea that you're trying to work with the locals here, instead of just coming, showing up and sort of like eating up all the resources and then who cares who lives there to begin with. I love the fact that the negotiation board, and that's where you're gonna get most of your points from the negotiation board. So you gotta work with people and do it in a peaceful way. I think that's super cool. It's just interesting the way that you roll out dice and you can assign dice to different action spots, but the costs of everything are really high. So you have to manage your resources. They're pretty tight, ultimately. Uh, you're trying to do a whole bunch of stuff on the planet. So Kane's First Light is really fun. The more we've kind of played it, the more we've kind of enjoyed the, the tricky resource puzzle that that game provides. And that's why it's on our list. Number two is my favorite, probably my favorite like social deduction game and that is Detective Club. Detective Club is kind of like if you smashed Spyfall and Dixit and they had a baby. If they had a baby, that's Detective Club. I don't, I, Dixit's fine. I really dislike Spyfall, but I love Detective Club. So Detective Club, what it is, is there's kind of a lead detective and um, theme. You know, and so they are essentially going to look at their hand of cards and they have these beautiful cards, but they're very Dixit like, very like weird, like dream cards, very surreal, a lot of weird stuff on them, you know? And they basically will look at their cards and they have all these notebooks and they go, okay. And they write down a clue on all but one of the notebooks. So they say the clue is like water, 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 and you leave one blank and then you shuffle them up and then you give them to everyone. So everyone, with the exception of one person, has a clue on that book. And so everyone then knows that the clue is water with the exception of one person. And then the lead investigator uh, will put down a card that pertains to that clue, which in this case is gonna be water. So maybe one with like an ocean on it or something like that. And then everyone in, in turn order will then put down a card that pertains to the clue. Boom, 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 boom. And then the lead investigator puts down a second card. And then everyone else puts down a second card. And then the lead investigator says, the clue was water. And now everyone has to then explain why their cards pertain to the clue. It's very simple, right? And it's really, really fun because what then you're trying to do is you then are gonna vote on who you think didn't know the clue. Who is the traitor? Who is the lead investigator trying to find or whatever? But the lead investigator actually wants people to not get found because then they are gonna get points as well. So then everyone is gonna go around and explain why their cards pertain to the clue and then everyone's gonna vote on who they think is the traitor. And the reason why I like this game and why I like this game significantly more than many other social deduction games, especially like Spyfall, is I like social deduction games where people have a very natural way of looking suspicious. Because here's the thing, I might know the clue is water, but none of my cards may have water. They might none have water on them. None, none have water on them. Nothing even remotely close to water. Nothing, not even like a rubber ducky, nothing. There's nothing on there. So you have to play two cards. So sometimes you knew what the clue was, but you just had really, really bad cards. And so you're kind of like, okay, here's the thing. Hold on, here's the thing. This is what I meant with this card. It's, there's a big W in the background. I thought W, water. That was for water, right? And everyone's like, uh, no, I don't buy that, dude. But you knew the clue. And then sometimes the person, if you're like the trader, you're just looking at everyone else's card being like, okay, that person put water down, that person put an ocean down, that one person put a bathtub. Maybe it has something to do with liquid. Maybe it has something to do with water. So sometimes you can hide really well as the trader, but sometimes you can't. And so it's really, really fun, but it gives you information to go off of. I feel like so many social deduction games, it's just like, who can lie the best? And, but you don't have anything to go off of. In this game, 
not only can you look around at everyone's card, you are told the clue before you have to justify your cards. So they go, the clue is water, and then everyone says why their things are water, and that makes such a big difference. The art is beautiful, it's really, really fun. I absolutely love Detectives Club. I think it's the best social deduction game out there, and no one, not enough people play it, it's great. Number one is a game we've had for a long time. This is Lanterns. This is a tile laying game that we really enjoy, still to this day, really enjoy. Uh, and man, we've gotten a lot, a lot, a lot of play out of it. <laughs> Lanterns is all about putting on a lantern festival. So you're gonna be placing on a tile from a tile in your, in your hand on your turn, and they're gonna have different colors of lanterns that are floating on water. And you're gonna add it to the kind of central display, which is gonna be a larger and larger area that's now covered with lanterns as we're all putting together this festival. Uh, and what's really cool is it uses where people are sitting at the table uh, and, and puts it right in the middle of the game. So if I put a tile down, it's got black going this way, green, green, and white coming my way. Whatever edge of the tile is facing that player, they're gonna get a card with that color on it. So you're always getting stuff off turn as well. And if it's my turn, I'm trying to make sure I don't give them anything that's super useful, make sure I get stuff that's useful for myself and I'm only gonna get what's pointing toward me. If I make a match bonus on the tile that I place, I'll get an extra uh, card as well. Once you uh, get some cards at the start of your turn, you can turn in some cards to ultimately do a dedication to the emperor by turning in uh, four of a kind of one color, three pairs, or one of all the different colors. So kind of simple set collection stuff. So the fact this game has, you know, some simple ideas like set collection, getting a bunch of colors together, is one that early on in our gaming days we were able to understand still. And then the whole idea of the spatial awareness of the table of like, Oh wait, if I do this, that gives them blue and that gives them every color. I don't want to do that. Or I notice here at the central table, there's no more green cards left. So I put green facing them. They can't collect a card that doesn't exist. So ha ha ha, I get to, you know, I win again. Uh, there's a lot of fun things to kind of consider while ultimately keeping a game that was really kind of entry level in terms of the mechanics and like rules to remember. Really, really enjoy that. I also enjoy that to, de to dedicate, you have to do it at the start of your turn. So it's not after you gather resources, you have to do it first thing. So you have to set yourself up so that when it comes back around to you, you're ready to go and make your action and stuff. Lanterns is just kind of an all time game for us. It doesn't get played as often anymore, but you know, it's just one of those ones that's not ever gonna go anywhere because like, it's just too near and dear to our heart. And that's why it's on our list. So those are 10 games that we really love from the yeah. 900 to 801 section of Board Game Geeks. We're already up to like 15, 20 games on this list that we had to I whittle know. down. It's just I gonna know. get worse from here, you know? I know, this is this, we've yeah. started on a, on a journey that is gonna hurt more than yeah. it's gonna help. It's gonna be tough. But nonetheless, that is our top 10 games from 900 801. Down in the comments below, let us know your top 10 games Please. or maybe just your favorite game from this particular 100. It's a lot of really, really good games in there. Oh my gosh. And the next one we do will be 800 to 701. Really, really excited for that one. Absolutely, we cannot wait to get into that. So stay tuned for more. Until then, I am Mike. I'm Nick. We are the Brothers Murph. We'll catch you all in the next top 10. Bye everybody.